Titus recognized the hardship of attacking from the east where the ravines were steepest. As a result, he decided to focus on the western flank of the third wall. The 10th Fratensis was left to hold the Mount of Olives while the three remaining legions were redeployed. The 5th Macedonica built a camp 400 meters west of the western gate, while the 12th and 15th legions established themselves opposite the Safinus Tower. Artillery positions were now deployed with their sights set on the city. Under their covering fire, each legion began constructing an earth and timber ramp up to the third wall. Jewish projectiles rained down from above and attack parties slowed construction at all times of night and day. However, the concentrated might of the three legions with artillery support proved too much. The attackers completed their ramps and soon were slowly rolling battering rams into place. The thudding of the rams signaled progress for the Romans, but also served as a rallying cry for the defenders. Militia units from around the city swarmed into place to pelt the crews and their guards with missiles from above while raiding parties attacked the engines on foot from postern doors. Brave defenders fought their way up to the ramp's protective sheds and were poised to destroy the equipment before Titus led a cavalry attack to drive them off. Before ramming was resumed, Roman engineers built three siege towers, which were too heavy to be overturned and which were also fireproofed. These were then rolled into place to provide close fire support for construction and clear the area of defenders. On the 15th day of the siege, the rams broke through the third wall. The Jews yielded the outer city to the Romans and withdrew to the second wall. Titus was eager to keep the momentum rolling and established a camp in the heart of the new city, tearing down many structures in the process. The rams were now brought into position once again and targeted the central tower gate. Within four days, a breach was formed. The legionaries formed up and advanced through the narrow gap, however they were met with an eerie silence. As the troops advanced cautiously through the seemingly deserted streets, they were all of a sudden attacked from all directions. The trap was now sprung and Jews began unleashing barrages of missiles into the dense infantry clusters. At the same time, Hit-and-run parties attacked any exposed troops who had strayed too far from the main body. In shock, the Romans attempted to retreat back through the breach but found that it was so narrow that only a few men could get through at a time. This choke point was a prime target for the bowmen and slingers of the defenders. Roman archer units were brought up to provide covering fire and eased up enough pressure to allow for a withdrawal. At the same time, however, the Jewish force was mobilized to surge ahead as the Roman tide receded. They rushed back onto the walls, unloading continual barrages onto the attackers. Meanwhile, sorties with large blocks of Jews pressed the Romans back while the breach was mended. Josephus recalls that the fighting raged all day long and into the night. Action around the tower gate continued, and by the fourth day, the legions once again broke through. This time, 
Titus ordered that the entire northern stretch of the second wall be torn down and the surrounding towers be manned by Roman forces. The Jews now pulled back to the first wall. This was part of a deliberate plan to carry out a fighting retreat against the Romans, conserving Jewish strength while maximizing their damage. The commanders were finally in a position to make a stand now that the defensive line had a much smaller surface area than at the start of the siege. This meant that the outnumbered Jews could far more readily concentrate forces and rebuff attacks. At this point, overall command of the defense had been granted to Simon, who held the first wall along the northern side up to the royal palace. Johns, Galileans, and Zealots held the Temple Mount and the Antonia Fortress on the eastern edge of the line. The legions advanced into the second city. Titus dispatched the 10th and 15th legions to raise ramps to the west where the second and first walls met. To the east, he had the 5th and 12th legions start construction against the Antonia Fortress. They did so under incessant sorties and missile attacks. Historians tell us that the Jewish forces at this point would have been able to bring to bear 300 bolt throwers and 40 stone throwers from the rebel armory. This firepower was considerable and must have forced the Romans to build their own protective countermeasures. On the 29th of May, after 17 days of intense labor and non-stop harassment, the Romans completed their attack paths up to the eastern and western flanks. Battering rams, siege towers, and numerous cohorts were brought up for an all-out assault. However, unbeknownst to the Romans, the Jewish forces had been hard at work themselves. They had secretly conducted sapping operations with a tunnel traveling under the first wall right up to the siege ramps against the Antonia. The excavations were supported by pit props, which the Jews set alight. As the fire took its course, the ground gave way and a huge chasm opened up, engulfing the ramps and their siege engines. Fires, which were temporarily smothered, erupted once more as the bitumen reignited and burned what remained of the equipment. The Romans had once again fatally underestimated the defenders and were reaping the consequences. To the west, Simon sallied out at night to attack the siege works in his sector of the battlefield. The brave rebels beat back resistance and fought their way to the rams, setting their sheds alight. The fires alarmed the legionaries who saw their hard work going up in smoke and rushed in to try and pull the rams out of harm's way. They were met by Jewish reinforcements streaming out from postern gates and a pitch battle ensued. A deadly tug of war followed over the rams with the rebels finally managing to complete their destruction. The demoralized Romans pulled back. Sensing an opportunity, the Jewish forces swarmed out of the city in pursuit, driving the legions all the way back to their camp. The retreat was stabilized when once again, Titus rode to the rescue with his cavalry. Fierce fighting ensued, but the rebels were finally pushed back to the first wall. The Roman siege lines were in shambles. Virtually all of their rams and ramps were a smoldering ruin by morning, and the morale of the legions must have been in a similar state. It was approaching the hottest part of the year now, water was running low, and building material was becoming increasingly hard to come by. Nonetheless, Titus launched an ambitious plan to restore the spirit and security of the men. His plan called for the construction of an 8 kilometer wall of circumvallation with 13 forts. To do this, he leveraged the proud nature of the troops by having the legions and cohorts challenge one another for the honor of being the first to complete their allotted portion of the wall. Relatively safe from Jewish attacks, the legionaries were free to reforge their unit cohesion through competitive labor. The result was a stunning success. Within three days, the entire structure was completed. Morale amongst the Romans was restored, while the Jews were left with a stunning sign that the Roman war machine wasn't backing down. If anything, things had just shifted into high gear.